Okay, I would like to welcome everyone to this panel, Systemic Risk, Inevitable or Preventable? I don't know that we'll be able to answer the question by the end of 60 minutes, but we'll try. We'll explore the issues around it. I want to introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, let's start with Dimitri Demic Demicus. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Okay, good. I practiced on the way over. Uh, Assistant Director at the IMF's Monetary and Capital Markets Department. We also have with us Fiona Frick, CEO of Unigestion, which oversees $20 billion in assets. Uh, and then to my left is Michael P.O.R. He's a commissioner at the SEC. He was at the White House during the financial crisis. And uh, to his left is Paul Shear, Chief Economist at S&P Global. And finally, at the far left, we have John Williams. He is president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve. So now that we have our panelists introduced, I wanted to start by defining our terms here, which is systemic risk. So I'd like each of our panelists to answer in about two questions, uh, sorry, two sentences, what systemic risk is and what they think the biggest single source of it is right now. Why don't we start with Dimitri? Sure. Well, the uh, most common definition of systemic risk is the risk of a serious disruption in the functioning of the financial sector that is so severe that it has significant repercussions in the working of the real economy. I imagine we're talking about financial sector systemic risks, not geopolitical and other risks. And as to what worry me now as the biggest source of systemic risk today, I would have to say it's probably some disorderly adjustment in China or emerging markets. Got it. All right. And because we have panelists from different walks of life, I'm hoping the answers they give will reflect a little bit of their expertise. Fiona, could you define systemic risk for us? I would have quite a similar definition. It's the risk of collapse of the entire financial system. And what is important is also the interconnection with the real economy. For me, one of the most important systemic risks today is perhaps government bond in some markets, typically Europe and Japan, where you have like 70 to 75 percent of the government bond bonds which are negative and bonds which are issued now at 100 years at 2% yield for, for example, Belgium. OK, so not necessarily in the United States, but outside of the US. Yeah. OK. Uh, Michael Piawar, over to mm -hmm. you. Uh, yeah, thanks. First of all, I need to do my standard disclaimer, which says that uh, any of the views I express are my own views, do not necessarily <laughs> reflect any of the views that anyone else to the commission, including my fellow commissioners, and oftentimes do not reflect their views. Uh, let me so just I interrupt see. you for a moment. Yeah. Dimitri, same goes for you, right? Exactly. And I assume, John, for yeah. you as well. OK. Good, now that that house keeps out of the way. Um, for me, the, the definition of systemic risk is the risk that the government will use taxpayer funds to bail out uh, organizations based upon uh, the perception, either real or perceived, that there is threats to the, f the stability of the financial stability of the United States. And in terms of uh, what I see are the, the two biggest sources of uh, systemic risk uh, are the federal government uh, through its fiscal policy and the Federal Reserve through its monetary policy. All right, we'll get John Williams's response to that in a bit. Paul, please, if you could. Mm. Well, just so I don't just repeat the same definition, maybe come out from a different angle. I, I think to me, the kind of the, the essence of what underlies systemic risk uh, you know, is the, the fact that you have a real economy and you have a financial or monetary economy. And the systemic risk really comes from the fact that the real economy is by definition, uh, by its nature, illiquid, you know, real assets, real hard assets uh, and people save for the future by investing in those hard assets. What the financial system does very cleverly, great uh, c invention of human nature, is to sort of liquefy all of the claims on these real assets. And then we sort of get tricked into, into sort of taking you know, liquidity and a well-functioning financial system as a natural state of nature, whereas actually that liquidity can dry up very quickly if people suddenly want to get their money out. So I think it's really the basis of systemic risk to me is that uh, sort of conundrum of, of the fact that uh, the financial system is in some sense artificially creating a situation that looks like uh, a lot of liquidity which it can actually disappear. Got it. In terms of what are the big risks, um, you know, I think just to be rather topical, the Brexit uh, vote on the 23rd of June, uh, if we're talking about risk rather than prediction or base case scenario, you know, were Britain to vote for an exit, that is a kind of a shock to the system, particularly in the European Union. Uh, I think the bigger slightly more durable risk that could shake global financial markets is a China hard landing. John Williams? 
So all the good definitions are taken. This is like an FOMC meeting where you go last. All the smart things have been said. <laughs> and then you either have to say something not too smart or uh, just agree with your uh, colleague. So I'm going to agree with Paul and Dimitri about the definition. I agree with that. The, pur the purpose of the financial system is to provide credit for the real economy. When the financial system becomes, uh, where the liquidity dries up, whatever, the real economy p is punished. Uh, millions of people lose their jobs. Uh, economy goes through a period of uh, extended period of stagnation. I mean, that's why we care about systemic risk. That's why it's really important. In terms of the big risk today, I'll go back to the one that uh, was already mentioned, but I'll put it in broader context. If you look at a broad set of asset classes, whether real estate, stocks, uh, uh, corporate bonds, you know, a broad, uh, broad array in the U.S. and abroad, uh, you can come to two uh, views about their uh, valuations. Either they're extraordinarily high or they're actually pretty fairly valued relative to the U.S. US Treasuries. Now, both of those statements are often true, uh, but it does highlight the point that was already made, that the U.S. Treasury, and I would say also sovereign, risk, uh, sovereign tre uh, bonds from other countries, are priced extraordinarily high, which is another way of saying interest rates are extraordinarily low. And to the extent that you know, mar interest rates do move up in the future, that means broad sets of assets uh, classes are going to see big movements downward uh, based on standard kind of arbitrage uh, type of relationships. So that's an area that I think is a potential risk. Okay. And I know, Dimitri, you've mentioned that you believe systemic risk has declined, and it sounds like that's kind of a view overall. Michael P.O.R., you mm -hmm. answered that the federal government is the biggest single source of systemic risk. So has it declined in your view? Uh, no, and if you look at, uh, in, in particular, fiscal policy, if you look at uh, you know the government's uh, the contingent liabilities on the government's balance sheet, uh, look at what happened with Fannie and Freddie during the financial crisis. They required the single largest uh, bailouts of any financial institution, and so the government is is um, incentivizing credit to go in various parts of the economy and can actually uh, exacerbate potentially the reaching for yield and, and the pushing up of asset prices and getting into a bubble situation which then can can then burst and, and other things can happen. If you look at what happens every time we get near uh, the debt ceiling limit and Congress threatens to not raise the limit and we get in a situation where maybe the federal government is not able to meet its obligations, then they get a letter from the Secretary of the Treasury that says that there's going to be all these bad things happen to the financial markets. There's threats to the financial stability. There's threats to um, you know, the U.S. dollars, the reserve currency, and all these other types of things. So to me, it's very obvious that uh, the government uh, is the source. And if you look at, there's actually some academic literature from folks like Deborah Lucas at MIT, who spent some time at the Congressional Budget Office, who uh, suggests that, that the, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is the council of regulators to, that looks at that systemic risk, um, should be looking at um, things like what should be on the, the federal government's balance sheet as a way to look inward rather than outward uh, on that. And then also uh, in terms of um, the Federal Reserve, if you look at what are the emerging threats to financial, uh, to systemic risks in the annual reports that are done by the Financial Stability Oversight Council and something called the Office of Financial Research, which is like the research arm uh, of the FSOC, uh, every year they put on their interest rate risks. And the fact that we've had uh, near zero interest rate risks, or in some cases negative risks, as uh, folks have mentioned, uh, that causes with reaching for yield and those types of things. And so. John Williams, care to respond? Sure. I mean, on the, on the latter one, uh, the, the fiscal issue, I'll, I'll just I'll leave that. Um, but on, on monetary policy, I, I put things into perspective. I think that the big challenge globally uh, is that, uh, and I'm going to use a little bit of jargon here, but basically the equilibrium interest rate, the interest rate that will is consistent with economies growing at their trend level and being at full strength, is just much, much lower today than it was 25 years ago. This is something a lot of economists have studied in the U.S. and abroad, and I've done a lot of work on this myself. And the point is, is that global supply and demand, for various reasons, mainly driven by lower demogra slower demographic growth, uh, population growth, lower productivity growth, is to equate supply and demand, the global economy is much, much, much lower interest rates uh, in the future than we're used to. So a lot of people say that's the Fed or the ECB or the Bank of Japan with very low interest rates. And some of that's true because we're trying to have a monetary accommodation to stimulate our economies. But a lot of it is actually just lower equilibrium interest rates driven by global factors. So one of the things that I really think everyone in this room should be thinking about is even after the Fed brings their interest rates back to normal rates and hopefully when uh, the Bank of Japan and the ECB and the, and the Swiss and everybody eventually are able to do that, we are going to be in a new normal with very low interest rates. And it's not because of the Fed, it's not because of the ECB, it's because that's the new normal out there. And I think that's just something that people should have in mind when they're thinking about uh, uh, the future and, and thinking about 
about what the factors are around the Fed versus kind of more the equilibrium. Um, well, let John, can I, can I jump in? Please. Just ask, do you think that's reflected, that point that you just made it, uh, in the dot plot that the, the FOMC puts out? It looks like you know, the neutral rate is still, what, three, three and a quarter or something like that? Yeah. So, so, t uh, so we do proud the dot plot. This is my favorite chart from the Fed, uh, and it shows what we expect uh, interest rates to be over the next several years and the longer run. And the typical median response is three and a quarter on the Fed funds rate. Compare, so that's a one and a quarter real rate and a two percent inflation rate. Um, my own view is about that. Um, and that's much lower than the, say, 4.5% you would have answered back in, uh, say, 15 years ago. Uh, and quite honestly, based on my own work and others, I would argue that there's some significant downside risk. So the new normal might very well be more like 3% uh, or 1% real rate. So in this new normal, Fiona Frick actually has a challenge of actually making money for her yeah. clients and finding some source of return for her clients. Do you see central banks and governments having a role in, in managing asset prices? I think central banks, it's interesting because they have a double mandate, which is some, somewhat contradictory because they have to support growth. This is a, one of the first mandates, even though it's less clear in Europe. And they have to uh, prevent systemic risk. The problem is by doing the first objective, sometimes they, they have an influence on the second one. And I think but by the fact that if we are in a world where interest rates are very low for central bank reasons and also economical reasons, it creates a challenge typically for the client we manage money for, which are generally pension funds and insurance company, because perhaps more in Europe than in the US, they have a certain liability. And either they won't be able to meet their liability because they remain in the traditional asset class they have invested in the past, or either they go in more riskier asset class, uh, which doesn't necessarily have the quality or the liquidity uh, that is necessary uh, for the risk they can take. So I think this low interest rate strategy will have an effect on the long term on the public saving uh, of uh, the people. At the same time, you have institutions that perhaps need to adjust their expectations as well and bring down what they think uh, are their assumptions for returns in this kind of environment. Do you see that happening, Dimitri? Are public institutions brave enough to reset their assumptions? By public institutions, you mean central banks? Central or? banks, governments, um, anyone who has liabilities, has obligations. Yeah. I mean, just first of all, to go back to the point that Fiona made, I think um, the government authorities or central banks don't have a business managing asset prices, but I think that quite often they respond to asset prices because asset prices have information that has policy content. So it's quite normal that the regulators and the policy makers will respond to these. Their actions in turn will have an impact on asset prices, but this is not the same as saying they're managing asset prices or they should be managing them. Now, have we all adjusted? I think the key question is what John mentioned. Have we moved to a world where the equilibrium long-term interest rate is really significantly lower than before? Um, I think the jury is out on this one, although, like John, I have also seen research that suggests that we have. And in that case, I think that would be a lesson that has not been fully incorporated by governments mm -hmm. as well as financial market participants, most notably insurance companies, as Fiona mentioned. So this new normal that we speak of, Paul Sheard, you were an expert on Japan. You spent more than two decades in Japan working for Bering, working for Lehman. Uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, the Japan experiment, what they've achieved, and what perhaps we can learn from what they've done or haven't done. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I think uh, you know, most of the lessons from Japan that I've talked about over the years, um, Scarlett, have really been on you know, lessons of what not to do. I think that Japan made some very big policy errors in the 1990s, uh, which you know, pretty much were the mirror image of what the US in particular, but other countries did in the financial crisis, which is faced with a, a major banking crisis, a latent banking crisis. Um, you, know, you have to act early, quickly. You have to act aggressively. Uh, and you have to act in a coordinated fashion as well. Japan basically used a policy of forbearance, that is, sort of covering up the problems in the banking system in the 1990s. How do they do that? They did, they did that by having a, a blanket guarantee of all, ba of, of all bank deposits. That sort of turned off the financial system pressures. Um, but also, they didn't do the kind of stress tests and the, um, the, the qual asset quality reviews that are now much more common. There was a whole sort of MPL guessing game going mm -hmm. on for, for years. And you know, every year, basically, there'd be a whole lot of write-offs in the banking system. But guess what? A whole new a bunch of MPLs would be recognized. And that just kept going for about you know, 10 years or so. So that's not a good idea a good idea uh, to do. Uh, I think, uh, so, you know, I think that the world did learn those lessons. Uh, you know, Ben Bernanke and many of the, the key policymakers, Tim Geithner, 
uh, or people who either spent time in Japan, Tim did, or uh, you know, spent a lot of time looking at Japan. So I think, I think those lessons were learned. If we fast forward now, of course, Japan's in a slightly different situation uh, with uh, Mr. Kuroda at the helm of the Bank of Japan. And uh, you know, that basically now policy has shifted 180 degrees. I call it a Copernican revolution uh, at the Bank of Japan in the sense that they are behaving much more like a, like a traditional inflation targeter, saying, yes, we can control inflation in the medium term. Um, we, we, we just need to deploy our tools, and we need to do that very aggressively. But you know, now that the Bank of Japan has moved into negative interest rates and sort of joined the European central banks, um, uh, you know, essentially the Bank of Japan has been doing monetary easing for 25 years. Yes. And now they finally get, you know, after the Europeans show them the way into negative interest rates, a very strange concept. We can come back and talk about that if you like. Um, Jose it really Canseco is very curious about it. It, <laughs> it, really does, it really does sort of beg the question of do you have the right uh, macroeconomic policy mm. mix. And again, specifically to stay on, on Japan, Abenomics was supposed to be all about using monetary policy and fiscal policy aggressively to end deflation, which is you know, pretty standard economics. And yet, just one year into the Abenomics experiment, uh, they raised the consumption tax basically put the, the fiscal brakes on the economy. So I think the big lesson from Japan, which you know, I think this resonates with other economies as well as, uh, you know, I think in, I would argue that monetary policy, I independence of central banks is fantastic. We know why we have that. But it sta has started to take on a life of its own where fiscal policy and monetary policy are sort of very much separated. And I think in the kind of conditions that the global economy, developed world economy, has been in the last few years, where the threat has been deflation and, and the lack of aggregate demand, better coordination uh, and perhaps more of a role for fiscal policy rather than monetary policy uh, would have been a good idea. And I think that would be a lesson from Japan. Dimitri? Yeah. No, I absolutely very much want to second this because one of the problems we have seen in most advanced economies is that we have relied too much on monetary policy so far to do the heavy lifting after the crisis, and fiscal policy has not done quite enough to support it. And the classic example of that is in Eurozone. It happens more or less in every country, but Eurozone is the best example where you have a significant fiscal tightening at the core of the Eurozone, and then a very, very loose monetary policy. And the, the problem is that they are now still not over their problems. Now, one issue that you one, offer here, one often hears about is about the coordination of monetary policy across borders. Mm -hmm. you know, is Europe is still loosening policy, whereas the Fed is about to tighten. And I think that's normal. Macro policy should be tailored to the needs of the country in question. And of course, they will have differential effects because the countries are linked. But this is nothing abnormal or, or unreasonable <laughs> about this. You shouldn't expect monetary policies to be coordinated simply because the business cycles are not coordinated. But the coordination within the country between monetary and fiscal policies and structural policies is essential, and we don't have quite enough of it. We don't have quite enough of it. Fiona? I would totally agree with what you said, but that's the, the beauty of a panel. Uh, I think the fact that uh, there is a more and more global economy means that, in fact, the problem is that the business now cycle are becoming more and more uh, connected. And the fact that, for example, it's true that the US has been growing, but the fact that China has been going quite badly last these months and that Europe is going quite bad refrains perhaps the US Fed to do the movement they can because the, the growth of the US is perhaps not so strong to, to be able to, to stand on its feet alone. So I think that there is a, a, a call a codependency, I would say, between business cycle of countries, which will create at the end a codependency between uh, central bank policy. What do you think about that, John Williams? A codependency, as Fiona well, Prick puts it. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about this earlier. I, 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 you know, codependency sounds like uh, that you you can't you always have to be doing the same thing. So I, I think that the point uh, is absolutely right. The U.S. economy is affected by what happens abroad, whether it's in Asia or Europe or. South America or, or wherever. Uh, and obviously, at the FOMC, we take that into account uh, because it feeds into whether we're achieving our inflation or employment uh, mandate goals. Uh, but at the same time, the, I would agree that uh, you know, we obviously, in a different
different place in our business cycle, it makes sense for us to uh, be moving interest rates gradually back to a more normal level over the next couple of years. I actually think that's a, a sign of strength for the global economy. And from the point of view of Japan and Europe, where you know they're seeing appreciation of their currencies, uh, you know the fact that the Fed is able to raise interest rates and, and move ahead is actually, I think, in a, in a way, a positive uh, for the for the global economy. But this basic point that we're all interconnected and that we can't we can't just uh, ignore what's happening around the world. I, I agree completely with that. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, developments around the world, including, as Paul mentioned, uh, the risks of uh, you know Brexit or things mm -hmm. like that. Well, we're all interconnected, and of course, Michael Pilar, in, in looking at some of the decisions that regulators have made with yeah. the stress tests and the living wills, uh, you see that banks and their foreign units are very much affected, and, and that uh, plays into whether they pass these stress tests. Talk to us a little bit about what policies that have been put in place, like these stress tests or uh, living wills, have been effective without too much collateral damage. Right, that's a good point, right? So. The government is a, is a source of systemic risk, and also the government can be a mitigating factor in systemic risk, particularly on the regular policy, regulatory policy side, sort of in, in both directions. And if you think, you know, what Dodd-Frank did, the, the single largest change in the financial regulatory uh, structure uh, in the United States, they put a number of policies in place, some of which uh, I think have actually made the system uh, stronger and more resilient. Uh, for example, higher capital requirements on banks. Um, you know, prudential regulators regulating bank safety and soundness is the number one concern, right? Failure is not an option. Whereas as a markets regulator, what the SEC is, you know, the capital markets, failure is an option and actually risk is priced in. And the prices that we see are actually giving information to us in terms of, um, you know, well-regulated well uh, uh, financial markets. You mentioned um, the, the CCAR process, the stress testing. Uh, and the living wills. Um, one of the things I've been trying to trying to change the narrative in terms of how we think about systemic risk or how we think about sort of regulating uh, the markets is there's this notion that sort of prudential regulation is uh, the right way to think about prudentially regulating markets. And so if you're a banking regulator, they think about um, the fact that there's these quote unquote shadow banks out there, whether they're asset managers or insurance companies, and that somehow prudential regulations like capital requirements are, 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 are appropriate for them. Uh, what I've uh, pointed out is that um, I think the biggest source of systemic risk in terms of going from the government and the Federal Reserve, it always goes back to the banks. Um, and what we need is more transparency into the banks. Investors need transparency into the CCAR process. Investors should see the results from the stress testing uh, requirements that the Fed puts uh, on them. What's more material information for investors than dividend policy or capital raising policy? Uh, with respect to the living wills, there's been a lot of written about how the, the banking regulators have failed the banks in terms of their living will process. What's more important to a bondholder than how um, various uh, subsidiaries are treated uh, in bankruptcy? So. Uh, I would prefer more transparency on the bank balance sheets rather than prudentially regulating the markets. So this extra transparency, Fiona, again, as the investor here, the, the, um, the loan investor in our panel, does that help you make a decision on putting more money into banks? Are they more appealing because there are living wills being published? There are all, all these stress tests that they have to endure every year? They change the nature of investment. I remember I was an equity manager for a while, and I still am. Uh, when, when you invested in a bank in the past, it was like investing with, in the market with more beta. And so it was something which was a cyclical industry and a growth industry. I think what's happening is transforming the bank into a much more defensive uh, part of a portfolio, which is not necessarily a s bad thing neither for the investor and clearly not a bad thing for the savers which uh, use banks for deposit. So I think it, it becomes more of a utility kind of regulated industry, which I think is in line with their main aim, which is to, to control the savings of the people. But does that slow the economy even more, Paul Sheard? Does that contribute to 2% GDP at best? I, I don't think, uh, I, mean, I would really approach, answer that question, I think, more in terms of you know, what's happening to potential growth, I mean, which is really a, a kind of an equilibrium concept of, of what is the potential growth. Um, and you know, maybe in the short term, you know, you know, the way that you implement these policies, there were concerns, for example, with you know, the fact that the economy was coming out of a very deep recession. If you pile on these capital requirements and, and, and other rules, um, that you get you know, maybe you know, more credit tightness in the system. But I think you know, that shouldn't be, you know, if, if, if you think from a pol public policy perspective that the sort of things that we're talking about here are, are necessary for the economy to have a safe, sound financial system and economy, uh, you wouldn't not do them because you get some short-term headwinds. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but I think in terms of you know where the potential growth of an economy um, is not ultimately going to be affected by the kind of rules that you um, that you put in place. The financial you know we're a, it's a market economy, it's a regulated market economy, but the markets will find and the private sector will find different ways of uh, you know of, of getting around those those uh, particular problems. Mm. I just wanted to go back to a point made earlier about regulating banks and have we gone too far, have we turned them into utilities and this is, a is this a good thing for growth? Um, there is no doubt, and I was actually happy to hear Mike say this, uh, um, that the system has become stronger as a result, largely as a result of the regulations we have put in place for banks, higher capital, more controls on leverage, and what is big in my mind, has not happened yet but is coming, is the ring fencing of retail operations. What has happened in the, or is happening in the UK, what may be happening here. It's not with us yet, but it will happen. This will not turn the banks into utilities, but it will protect the more socially sensitive part of it, which is the management of depositors, small depositors' money. Uh, we don't want to turn them into utilities. I think having investment banking, having banks, entities at the, co at the, at the front of financial innovation is very useful for growth. But these have to be separated from lower risk activities and more socially sensitive activities. And that ultimately is better for society because of greater financial stability. John Williams, when we spoke earlier, you mentioned ring fence and you said it's a dirty word in regulatory circles. Yes. Well, I think this is uh, you know, one of the more controversial issues. And that is, you know, basically every uh, country has, is concerned about their own economy. Political elected officials are obviously going to be worried about their own economy. Regulators are obviously going to be worried about their own uh, financial institutions, their own economies. But we're in a global financial system. And if you look at the, the Lehman Brothers failure and, and what followed from that, um, you, you know that the, uh, the effects of a, a failure of a, a systemically important institution depends critically on what happens across borders and how complex these organizations are often with, you know, in operating in, in over 100 countries. So I, to my mind, uh, you know, I think that this is the still unanswered question. I think we've done amazing uh, work in the U.S. and in many other countries about making our banking uh, banks much more uh, resilient, stronger. Uh, I'm also very uh, uh, happy with the work that's going on with the living wills and also with the, we call the SIPI surcharges, basically having to hold more capital if you're a very large organization to, to take on the too big to fail. But I do think this is the, the remaining piece of work that is, is probably more challenging because it's one thing for the U.S. to say, you know, here's what we're going to do with all of our organizations and here's how we're going to deal with the foreign banking organizations. But we really do need to find a way to cooperate and, and coordinate our, uh, our regulatory activities across borders, I think, more effectively in the future for this to be uh, truly successful. So when I looked at the question the, in the session title, inevitable or pre preventable, I want to say both. Uh, it, there is always going to be systemic risk. I do worry about this in terms of the, the international context, but of course what you're trying to do is reduce the probability and, and make it more preventable. Fiona? I would say like systemic risk is a bit like the Greek monster Idra, you know, like uh, you cut the head and the <laughs> head comes back. <laughs> so uh, I think the beauty with systematic risk, which is not necessarily the beauty, is it's an evolutionary process. And uh, it's true, okay, we have regulated the banks. Uh, I'm not saying that you, we have to regulate it, everything, but uh, you can see with shadow banking that, uh, and with credit intermediation, uh, some of the credit has moved away from bank and went to, to the asset managers. It doesn't mean that you have to regulate asset managers the way, same way you regulate bank, but one has to take into account that the system will always evaluate and there will be new systemic risk. Uh, it doesn't mean that I think there should be one regulation for everybody and each part of the financial system should have its own regulation and perhaps it's not the financial entity that should be regulated but more the activity and how it interacts with the financial market. But I think that we shouldn't forget that the systemic risk is something which is evolutionary mm -hmm. and uh, just trying to, to ring fence, I, don't, I know it's a, it's a dirty word, part of the market is perhaps a very uh, backwarding strategy rather, rather than a forward looking strategy. Mm. You know, one mistake we often do when we try to assess systemic risk is to look at each sector of the financial system separately. So we look at banks, we do a stress test for banks, and we say, okay, the banks are strong and resilient. Then we look at insurance companies, we take measures there, we take solvency too. Incidentally, I was making a joke the other day that if, if you want to have a club with zero members, perhaps you should consider starting a club called Friends of Solvency too. <laughs> I haven't met anyone. Mm -hmm. That's another discussion. Then you look at your asset managers, you say, okay, they have risks, obviously, but they're not 
they could not become systemic, so you need some conduct regulation or investor protection. Then you look at uh, payment systems, etc. But true systemic risk can arise because of the interconnections between mm -hmm. sectors. This approach works well when you have a relatively simple system that is dominated by one sector. For example, a bank-dominated, relatively closed system the way you find in many countries in Europe. But for complex interconnected systems like the US or the UK, this approach doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The trick is what happens in the interconnections between sectors and how the structure of that market changes completely new entrants coming in and that is what we don't do enough of as regulators and supervisors, try to understand how these linkages work. That's, can I jump in on Please. that? I, I think that's an excellent point, and I think it, it also goes to the point that ultimately I think most of the time it goes back to the bank. So if you think of, John mentioned uh, Lehman Brothers, that same week we had AIG, right? And you remember that you know, the, the, the Fed um, in, in the narrative is bailed out AIG. No, they didn't bail out AIG. They bailed out the creditors of AIG. And who were the creditors of AIG? The insurance company was the banks, right? The reserve primary fund broke the buck, right? And there was a run on money markets, not just money market funds, but money markets more generally. And what was the concern over that? Well, that the non-financial institutions weren't going to be able to use their lines of credit from the banks. And that was also the concern that the banks were not going to be able to roll over their short-term credit, their short-term funding, and they would become insolvent. And so what that tells me is that there is the links between um, insurance companies in the, uh, that go to the banks and then also the money market funds that go to the banks and it was just told me that there was too much counterparty exposure to the insurance, insurance companies from the banks and the banks were too reliant on short-term funding and so when you start looking across sectors you start end up um, following that narrative and following that story. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting point, interesting point, I think an important point. At the same time, I think one of the strengths of the U.S. financial system uh, is that it's diverse. Uh, it's not just a banking system. So if you look at a uh, banking-led system, we have capital markets makes up you know, the majority of uh, lending of, you know, of our financial system. So one of the things it means is if one piece of it is in distress or having uh, trouble, you know, people can go to the other parts so they can fill in uh, the gap. So I, 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 th I agree with the point that interconnected between the banks and the rest of the system creates some fragilities and some risks. At the same time, I think it does create some of the re resilience too. So it's one of those challenges that we all face in the real world of, you know, basically trying to have a, you know, a, a most effective system we can, but one that doesn't isn't fragile. Uh, and I think it's it's an ongoing cha challenge. I agree with the the evolution point. I think the real challenge is, that, you know, I always say if it, if it you know, basically if it, if it acts like a bank, it should be regulated like a bank. And mm -hmm. and and you know the the hard part there is you know where exactly do you, do you draw those those lines? Remember, for all those people th who want to argue it was the big banks that caused the financial crisis. I mean, all the uh, the companies that are the, were in the headlines, as we just heard, were Bear Stearns, AIG, Lehman Brothers, uh, you know, mu money market mutual funds, and things like that. None of them were regulated uh, for pr for prudential or safety and soundness uh, reasons. They were all regulated for basically either investor, or basically investor protection. So it just shows you how our old system uh, really wasn't even thinking about, in a sense, all the things we're talking about uh, right now. Fiona, do we still have too big to fail? Uh, I think it's not too big to fail, which is important. It's too interconnected to fail. It's much more important. Uh, too complex to fail. Too complex to fail, yeah. And I think, like, uh, we, we saw, uh, obviously, it was not a bank with LTCM, that even an asset manager can, can, can pose that one problem, some systemic risk. I think there are some systemic risks for banks. There are also systemic risks for asset manager. But I think for asset manager, it's completely a different model. We go from a principal model to an agent model. I think the way asset manager creates systemic risk is more the way they, they interact in the market. Uh, one of the biggest systemic risks you can see is if they propose liquidity mismatch between how they place the money on the market and the liquidity they provide uh, to, to the people that invest with them. So typically for me, this is a systemic risk from mm -hmm. asset manager. So it's more the activity and how they interact with the market, which is a risk for, for asset management. So clearly there's going to be risk no matter what. You can't regulate it out of existence. Uh, Paul Sheard, what systemic risks are economists comfortable with in projecting out stable growth that's not so fragile and so dependent on uh, banks being able to continue lending to each other? Well, I don't think that economists necessarily are very good at, at forecasting systemic risk. I think probably um, you know, virtually every economist uh, uh, forecast is going to have some assumption that their systemic risk doesn't manifest itself and, and drive the, the economy. But just to, to add a little bit to, to the conversation uh, that we've just been having, um, 
you know, I mean, I think the thing about s systemic risk is we are talking about a system. And I suspect that, you know, you can, part of me sort of says you can, and, and I'm not saying these are not worth doing, but you can set up all the rules in the world in Basel III and Volcker rule. And in the US, you have, for example, FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight uh, uh, Council. Council that Mike mentioned. Um, and, you know, you can be like checking all the boxes, etc. But when uh, the next really, truly systemic events, uh, event hits, my gut feeling is that it'll probably be some manifestation of dynamics in the system as a whole that may just ex ante be impossible to actually see. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the EPSOC is, is great on paper, but when I look at uh, you know, when I look at that that kind of uh, entity, the, uh, it's a little bit like the FOMC from a different perspective, <laughs> but I think monetary policy is different. But the idea that, you know, 12, 15 people sitting in Washington around a table looking at a whole lot of data and looking for the next, uh, you know, systemic event and being clever enough to see it and therefore getting around too big to fail. As somebody who, uh, among the economists I like, you know, Frederick Hayek, has a Hayekian streak in me, I find that a little bit counterintuitive. But again, I think probably people agree on that. We hear in the political debate, we've outlawed too big to fail. I think probably everybody in this panel thinks, you know, in reality, we haven't really done that. Mm. And you're not a big fan of FSOC at all, Michael. Well, I actually, I'm so much of a fan, I'd like to actually go to the meetings, but they won't let me go. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> for those of you not familiar, so uh, our, 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 our regulatory system in the United States is highly fragmented. We have the SEC, we have the CFTC, we have three banking regulators, we have the FHFA for housing. And it's all under NCUAs, that umbrella. All in a big umbrella. And um, we're all independent agencies and we have bipartisan boards. Um, but the Financial Stability Oversight Council is made up by only the chairs of the agencies involved. And so only the chair of the SEC gets to go and the rest of us commissioners do not get to go uh, and have a voice in the process or get any information about uh, what's going on in terms of, um, uh, in terms of you know, whether they think that MetLife is systemically risky and the courts obviously disagreed with that and, 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 and some of the other issues. Um, and, you know, as, as, to, to follow up on what, uh, what Paul was saying, right, I mean, economists are... Are, are, I mean, I tend to be sort of more in the Hayekian camp too, which is, you know, there's, we can't, there, there's too much hubris going on. There's this form of what they call scientism, where you think that if you have all the numbers and stuff that you can, you, know, you can minimize all the risk, but as, as Andy Haldane, the head of financial stability of the Bank of England pointed out, that what we're really measuring is, on, what we're really trying to do is figure out how to deal with uncertainty, not risk. And risk is what you can measure, uncertainty is the unknown unknowns, mm -hmm. to borrow a phrase from, from Donald Rumsfeld, and that was by a actually, genius phrase. yeah, exactly. And so, by focusing maybe too much on this, on this, what we think we can get the Basel, you know, capital standards, the risk weightings exactly right on all these things, but then there's some other shock that comes to the system that we never saw. What we need to do is build a resilient system um, to deal with the next shock that comes through, rather than trying to predict what that next shock is. Scarlett, can I just add uh, just one more point, um, which really hasn't been discussed yet, which is um, p particularly because of the, the fact just what we've been observing, uh, is I think it really is important to have a lender of last resort, which you know, is essentially the Fed. Um, you need, you know, if, if you do get into a situation where something goes wrong, and you know, I come back to my original definition of systemic risk, where liquidity dries up, the only entity in the economy that can create liquidity essentially costlessly you know, is the central bank. And I think one of the, you know, the whole narrative around the financial crisis and the, and the response was, um, you know, the Fed in particular got a lot of, um, you know, uh, kind of criticism and, and, and uh, opprobrium for the way it used section 13.3. And, you know, some restrictions have been put on that. Fortunately, it hasn't been closed down. It's still there. Um, but I think one of the learnings of the crisis, which I think put too much emphasis on the moral hazard arguments. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is moral hazard. But I think it's much more important that you do have a fire brigade that can turn up on the scene of a fire and put it out uh, than you just say, let it burn to the ground, let the whole town gr burn to the ground. We have to teach people a lesson. So I think the lender of last resort function People don't want to talk about it too much because of the moral hazard aspect, but gee, you know, you really do need that as a last resort in this kind of world that we're talking about. Um, I, I wanted to go back to the point about systemic risk. I get the feeling that we all like to knock on economists for being very bad at predicting things, which is true. Um, <laughs> but and having you know built a bit of a career on stress testing banks, I just want to push back a bit the notion. So it's useful to think of systemic risks, risk as coming in two flavors. The sort of pro-cyclical behavior, what in 
older, more innocent days used to be known as irrational exuberance, what everybody's moving in one direction, and then whatever the asset price or exchange rate is overshoots and that there is a correction. And the sort of structural component of flavor or version of systemic risk, which is a too big to fail. Now it turns out we are actually not that bad in trying to understand which part of the cycle, which point on the cycle we are. It's not that difficult to figure out whether there is overheating. It, it is not easy, but it is not impossible. What is far more difficult is to understand what institution or what market or what function is too big to fail. And there I just want to agree with what more or less everybody has said. It's not something you can legislate away. Mm -hmm. It is something that we have not tackled yet. Ring fencing of banks will help as far as banks are concerned. But there are other institutions that are too big to fail. And we have not even started to think about how to address that problem. The typical example I like to bring is payment systems or clearing houses. Mm -hmm. These are almost by definition too big to fail. So while I agree it's probably futile to try to predict where the next crisis will come from, if you want to assess the resilience of the sector, of the banking sector, then I think analytical approaches, stress testing, are actually the way to go and they can give you quite a bit of information, but not predicting the next crisis. Got it. All right, before we open things up to questions, I wanted to get each of the panelists' thoughts. I think on John what wanted to say something. Oh, John, uh, John uh, please. He, uh, you, you wanted to uh, call this out because I just want to agree with you. Uh, I agree 100% with that. And I'm actually a little struck by uh, the, la the other comments by uh, Mike and Paul because I mean, I think everything we've been doing about having more capital, more liquidity, about having, you know, uh, SIFI surcharges, the, the stress, uh, the CCAR is all based on some notion of nighty and uncertainty. The, f the notion that we don't really know what the next thing's going to be. Because we don't know, we're going to, we want a fortress. We want something that if there's a, you know, there's a big tidal wave or a tsunami or whatever, you're going to survive that. I think that's the whole reason we have the things that we have. Now, it's true. We spent a lot of time wargaming different scenarios, and we build in scenarios into the stress test by to capture some of these risks that we're thinking mm -hmm. about. But the basic defense is one of, I think, of one based on uncertainty and knowing uh, the, you know, basically having the humility that we can't predict what the next one's going to be, so we want to be protected no matter what it is. So I, I disagree with the tone that we've been you know, relying too much on the economists. I think we've been, in fact, we've been relying on the fact that we know that there, uh, it's really about uncertainty that you can't predict the future. So that's Okay, good. we can't predict the future. There's a lot of uncertainty, but work still needs to be done. What do you think is at the top of that to-do list, John? Top of the to-do list for in terms of the for addressing systemic uh, risk. Right now, uh, there's coordination yeah. between central banks. Yeah. Is that yeah. sufficient? So yeah, no. I think that right now, systemic risk is really not the big biggest problem. I mean, we talked about different aspects mm -hmm. of this. Right now, we're I would say we're still more or less in a risk-off environment because of what's happened. Um, what I worry a lot more about is when people forget about the financial crisis. They forget about the terrible things that happened. And I go back to uh, this base. Basic uh, insight that many uh, experts have brought up, which was part of the housing bubble, part of the financial crisis, was driven by this incredible demand for something called safe assets or money money assets. Uh, the U.S. Treasury produces lots of those. Uh, we talked about that earlier. Uh, other governments pr produce those. But what you basically had in the housing bubble was this huge demand, or basically demand for something that's like a treasury, something you can repo, something that's money-like uh, that has a return. Uh, so that's how we got CDO, CIO. CD, you know, all of those markets, uh, all of that. Um, that's not the big risk right now, but that insatiable demand for money-like assets or safe assets is still there and is just waiting for the next clever financial engineer to come up with a new asset class that says, these risky securities, when you run them through my special blender <laughs> and you separate the ingredients out, you're going to get this really clear water at the top, which is AAA perfectly safe. So that's the thing I think we need to be thinking about for the future. It's not today. That's not happening today. But I, I do worry that's going to happen in the, in, in the next five to 10 years. I think one saying about the new invention, etc. I think one of the new development which could be source of systemic risk, you could be ETF, for example, because ETF gives a false sense of liquidity mm -hmm. to sometimes some underlying instruments which are not. At the beginning, ETF, okay, it was for S&P 500, so it was quite liquid, etc. Now you see going into much more illiquid asset class. Uh, you see smart beta where you start also going into much more complex construction mechanism. So it's perhaps not CDO whatsoever, but it's a new 
force which is taking more and more uh, place in the financial markets which is also very much bought by retail investors etc which is not completely uh, assessed in terms of liquidity risk and that gives a false sense of liquidity security because you can deal with this instrument on a daily basis so there's complacency as a result mm -hmm. not complacency i would say a, a lack of understanding that the li liquidity which is attached to the ETF is not necessarily the liquidity, which is the one of the underlying instrument. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I jump in on this? Um, I would disagree that that's potentially a systemic risk, but I agree that there is a potential liquidity risk there. And in fact, the SEC, we have a rule proposal out right now that deals with liquidity risk management programs for investment companies, including ETFs. And it's something that we're actively uh, looking at right now. And so to the extent that folks in the audience are, are, are or people listening to the webcast or whatever uh, have comments on. We have an active comment process on that right now, thinking about the fact that we have ETFs that have you know, sort of on-demand liquidity and we have uh, open-end mutual funds that have daily liquidity uh, and thinking about the, the, the liquidity transformation uh, on that. I want to uh, uh, follow up on something uh, that, uh, that John mentioned, this sort of insatiable demand for money-like uh, or cash-like instruments that's out there. Uh, and I agree that that, that, that was um, you know, uh, one of the big problems leading up to the financial crisis, right? And if you think about it, you know, the Basel capital standards, the risk weightings that economists dreamed up is that if you have a quote AAA security, right, that, that, that you have to hold, you have to have, I want to say hold less capital, you have to have less capital financing it on the right hand side of your balance sheet. Um, so that, that creates the incentive to create AAA securities that are out there, right? Or money like securities that are out there. And in fact, um, through a lot of the policies in Dodd-Frank has increased that um, incentive to do that. And so, uh, Dimitri mentioned the payment systems and the clearinghouses. One of the things Dodd-Frank did, uh, not only did not solve too big to fail, was actually created a whole new class of too big to fail institutions called CCPs, and for counterparties mm -hmm. uh, in the OTC derivative space. And what happens is, you know, the banks are the ones that, 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 that bring the, um, uh, these contracts to the clearinghouse, and then the clearinghouse says how much collateral do you have to hold against those. And the collateral is these you know, very safe types of assets. So there's all these new government regulations that are coming out that are going to continue over time to increase the demand for these safe assets and potentially actually create the problem that we're trying to prevent. Fiona, where do you go for the safest assets that are most liquid that can still give you some return that's not negative? Equity. <laughs> Equity? Yeah, still liquid. If you're a long-term investor, it's fine. You have to be able to cope up with the liquid, with the volatility. But then you need the economy, the underlying economy, to be growing at a certain pace. So I remain an optimist, I imagine. <laughs> 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 All right, why don't we open up our panelists to uh, questions and answers from our, our audience. Uh, could we pass the microphone down? And if you could identify who you're asking the question to, that would be helpful. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I want to first thank the, uh, I think the panel is a great one. I'm the, my name is Clever Gatete. I'm the Minister of Finance from Rwanda. And I was the governor of the Central Bank previous to this. Uh, I was very, very much interested because I thought, especially during the financial crisis, I agree with uh, almost all of them. Uh, definitely, regulation is very, very important uh, for the banking system. Definitely ha make sure that you protect the depositors' money, uh, including the Battle Three. Stress tracing is very important, and also transparency is extremely important. But I never heard about the, um, what I would call cooperation, because the risk can come from anywhere. Insurance, capital market, banking system, they are all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And usually the regulators to share information becomes very critical. At the same time, uh, in terms of the cross-country uh, information, is very important given the nature of the banking system, which is global in nature. I didn't hear about the um, sharing of information at the global level uh, in terms of regulating, which is, I thought was very, very important. Thank you. John, would you like to answer? Well, I, I agree. I mean, I think regu uh, central banks, uh, regulatory agencies uh, have to uh, meet regularly, share information. Uh, and I think that the financial crisis just re uh, uh, underlying that need to uh, be on, uh, have stronger relationships. I think it is uh, the issue that Mike brought up is that we're fragmented even within the U.S. <laughs> much less. You didn't even mention all the state, state bank State's regulators yeah. and uh, insurance regulators. Uh, but I do think this is something. I know my colleagues at the Board of Governors spend a lot of time working through Basel, through other uh, uh, international organizations, and I, I agree it's something that, uh, like I said earlier, uh, it needs to get even more focus. 
I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we spend a lot of time at the SEC uh, working on international harmonization type issues. Uh, uh, you know, as John mentioned, we're trying to get on the same page, for example, with the CFTC, which mm -hmm. you know, we together regulate this new over-the-counter derivatives markets and try to get harmonization there. At the same time, we recognize that there are, there are international financial institutions that are subject to regulations in their own jurisdictions that may not be exactly the same as ours in, in recognizing that there are these international institutions. We need to work with our international regulators to, to, to work through issues of what we call substituted compliance. And so we say, all right, you know, your, your, you know, your regulatory system may not be exactly the same as ours, but we can rely on you to make sure our banks are complying in, in your jurisdiction and, and vice versa. And we work through international organizations like um, the FSB, the Financial uh, Stability Board, uh, and IOSCO. And I note that uh, Rwanda is, uh, is, is an associate member of IOSCO and working with us on those issues. And then also not only in the regulatory policy side for harmonization, but also on the enforcement side as well, too, because um, fraud is, is global in nature because our markets are global in nature mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and working through in, in, uh, information sharing as well, too. Scarlett? Yes. I just wanted to say, I mean, this is to agree for on the importance of this point, but also to remind everyone that th there has been progress on international cooperation among supervisors. So not only the FSB that, that um, Michael mentioned that has promulgated standards, but there are now supervisory colleges for big banks and big institutions across countries. In the new framework for bank resolution, there will be resolution colleges that will work. So, so there is progress, not to say that there is nothing left to be done, but we are certainly in a different world in terms of understanding the need for international cooperation than we were before the crisis. All right, next question. Uh, yes, Th does the panel see any similarities uh, between China today and Japan uh, post the bursting of their bubble in the early 90s? And what coordination is taking place between the lessons learned from Japan and recommendations being made to the PBOC or uh, the regulatory bodies in, in China? Paul Sheard? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, there are some, there are some def definite uh, parallels, um, but of course, you know, for every parallel, there's also a difference, so it's, it's a little bit of fraught territory, but, uh, you know, China has had, um, you know, obviously a, a credit-fueled investment boom, it's had very uh, buoyant housing markets, uh, et cetera, and it's having some cooling off. It hasn't had exactly, uh, well, by no means, the kind of sort of economy-wide uh, sort of asset price bubble that Japan had in the second half of the, of the 1980s. So the challenge for China might, and you know, China's at a very different stage of its economic development, its institutional development and maturity than Japan was back in the 80s and, and 90s. But there are parallels of where China might be going. China, in some ways, today looks a bit like a collage of Japan in the 70s with the breakdown of the Bretton Woods, moving to a, a floating exchange rate, a slowdown in the economy after the investment-driven growth of the, of the highest of the 60s and 70s, the early 70s, um, and then financial deregulation and liberalization, et cetera, et cetera. All of that in Japan sort of then led to the bubble. So I think China is more at the moment in the situation of how do, you ma how do they prosecute what they're trying to do, uh, dismantling financial repression, opening up their economy to market forces, et cetera, uh, and not trigger a Japan style of situ uh, situation. One thing I, you know, I, I certainly notice when I have interaction with Chinese policymakers, um, you know, they're not acting in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an intellectual vacuum here. They're very w aware of the Japanese experience, the US experience, other countries' experiences. Um, having said all of that, I think there is still, though, Jap China has had this credit boom, and there is a debt overhang and a credit overhang. Uh, and there is, everybody's talking at the moment about overcapacity uh, mm -hmm. in steel, coal, and some other sectors. So there is an element of China that does look a bit like Japan circa the first half of the 1990s. And I think the big policy lesson there is that to the extent that there are problems in the system which are sort of you know opaque at the moment because of the it's a banking system not a capital market system so these things can remain latent for longer uh, you know I think my policy advice to China would be resist the temptation that mm. Japan uh, fell uh, to which is sort of cover it up play for time hope you'll grow out of the problem because that's a recipe uh, for creating these so-called zombie firms and, uh, and and zombie uh, you know banks as well so keeping all of that in mind, Fiona, when you are investing your client's money and you're looking at equities, um, how do you go about discerning between potential winners and losers in Chinese equities, in Chinese companies, many of which are being kept uh, afloat by the government? I think what is w most worrying in the Chinese economy for the moment is the growth of the corporate debt market. 
and that there is obviously some zombie companies. And it's not very clear uh, the relationship between the states and the corporate debt. Uh, so do you avoid it then? or? Yeah, we would tend to avoid it for the moment, yes. OK, but, but you still need some exposure to China. You can have it indirectly uh, by companies that uh, export in China or things like that. If, if you want to play the consumer sector in China or the fact that there will be, uh, I don't know, new infrastructure program in order to boost mm. growth, you can play it indirectly rather than play it through Chinese companies. Got it. All right, our next uh, question from the audience, sir. Uh, this is an open-ended question to the entire panel. Uh, if you were given three wishes by a finance genie, <laughs> what would they be to minimize system risk? Dimitri, you want to kick it off? Uh, <laughs> three wishes, <okay>. three. <laughs> three. All right, so, um, right, so the first thing I would say is find us a way to tackle too big to fail. Find us a way to understand and to mitigate it. I'm not sure that we can eliminate it. OK, number two? Um, so number two would be um, keep the political will to tackle the problems of the crisis that seems to be waning as memories of the crisis fade. That was seven long years ago. OK, exactly. number yes. three? Uh, number three, oh boy. Um, <laughs> you got three wishes, come on. Um, uh, uh, let me see what my other pa fellow panelists say. <laughs> Anyone want to jump I in have with one. their wishes? Uh, I think what, what is interesting is that it's, it's very complicated as an asset manager to understand exactly how the liquidity moves and, and, and the size of the transactions that happens in the market. So one my, of my wishes is, and for example, MIFID II in Europe, instead of helping uh, this discovery of liquidity has made it even more complex because all these systems and new uh, way of tradings. One of my wishes would be to have a sort of overall board where you could see exactly how much is traded in which instrument uh, between regulated market and unregulated market. I'll get everyone at Bloomberg to work mm. on that. <laughs> no, I won't, not three, but just one. Please. I think would be uh, you know, for somehow the genie to uh, make it such that you know, people didn't forget the lessons of the past. Um, you know, most financial crises sort of happen because you get this irrational exuberance, you get credit-fueled asset uh, price bubbles developing. Um, you know, if, if everybody could keep uh, a copy of Kindleberger or Minsky or something, uh, you know, by their bed table, that might help. Michael or John? I'll go with uh, better regulatory transparency. Uh, one of the lessons I learned, you mentioned I was working in the White House during the financial crisis, was that, um, you know, the policymakers uh, whether it was the Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson or, or, or Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, were oftentimes making decisions without full information. Um, you know, people forget before Dodd Frank, um, the regulatory agencies, the banking agencies, the market uh, regulators, uh, we were prohibited from regulating over-the-counter derivatives, and mm -hmm. so we had zero idea in terms of the the interconnectedness. Yeah, you're between, fumbling in the dark. We're fumbling completely in the dark. And so one of the things that drives me as a regulator now is getting better regulatory transparency. That doesn't mean that will that will guarantee that people will make good decisions. It would just minimize the risk of making bad decisions in the future. Courage. That's Courage. what I think was the most important thing in the crisis. I was watching uh, Bernanke, Ben Bernanke, watching others, and uh, these were all bad choices. These were all very difficult situations. I agree, we didn't know what was going on. Uh, uh, having the experts who had studied history, who knew things from 100 years ago, from 30 years ago, uh, and who knew uh, what was needed to do, to do and they did it, uh, and I think that's really what makes a difference. It really is the lesson from Japan, too. Ben Bernanke had studied what happened in Japan. Others had studied what had happened in Japan and we learned from that. It's not because we're better than they are or something, but we saw what happened there and we took a very different uh, set of decisions. And I remember before Ben's memoirs came out, I thought that the word I always used for him was, uh, was courageous. And I think that's the thing you need to have uh, when you're in a situation like that. It's the waiting around, hoping it will get better, is the thing that uh, is a prescription for disaster. Courage and moving forward. Okay, um, another question from our audience? Yeah, two more questions. Two more? Yeah, two more. Okay. When's the Fed going to raise rates? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll spare you that one. Um, it just strikes me looking at the background and seeing Milken's name um, and thinking about the history of, of corporate lending um, and the fact that when you look at leverage lending and you think about crises in the past 30 years, none of them have been caused by leverage lending. Yet when I read in the journal about where the emphasis is right now, from a regulatory standpoint in terms of the corporate world vis-a-vis -vis the banks, 
It's actually on lending guidance. Um, when I think about what happened in the crisis, and we've talked, it's been touched on by the panel, um, it was an issue of derivatives. And it doesn't really matter how, what the capital requirements are at banks, the quantum of derivatives that can be created can always swamp the regulatory, uh, the capital that, that's set aside. So I'm wondering for the panel what the prospects are and thoughts are around actually regulating derivatives and putting your arms around that, because that seems to me to be the, the real systemic risk problem. Michael? Well, so the first is getting uh, what I mentioned, regulatory transparency, right? So the first for me is just getting the data, right, and looking at who are the big players, what are the exposures in this market, right? The second move that Dodd-Frank created was the moving to more of this from a bilateral relationship into clearing houses. Now, that has mm -hmm. benefits in terms of mutualizing the risk. However, it has the downside of putting, concentrating the risk in these clearing houses, and clearing houses themselves have no particular knowledge of the risks of any particular mm -hmm. markets. And in fact, if you think about the risks of the clearing houses, as an economist, Craig Prong points out, that the risk are a function of two things. One is the risk of the, 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 the instrument that you're bringing to the, clearance ha the clearing house, and the other is the risk of the balance sheet of the institution bringing it to the clearing house as well, too. And so going forward, one of the things that, that worries me going forward in terms of sources of systemic risk that Dimitri mentioned was, in fact, the CCPs and concentrating that, that, that risk. All right, we have time for one final question. That's it. <laughs> to a certain extent, isn't the only systemic risk the solvency or at least perceived solvency of the major governments in the countries? Because everything from the, you know, money good items to, you know, the lender of last resort to everything else is based on the governments at least having the aura of being able to make it to the next step. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing we haven't covered. Yes. Scott? Yes, from John Williams. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I think, uh, I think governments are, 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 are different. Uh, if governments are able to borrow in their own currency, they're able to, to create currency. Um, what the problem in the Eurozone is that it's a system basically where countries are not able to borrow in their own currency, and that is one of the, the areas of sort of economic systemic risk. Yeah, you sort of have like a meta definition of my systemic risk was the, the risk of governments bailing out, and if they don't have the money to do it, well, then that's an even more systemic risk that's there. So you have a meta systemic risk, I think. <laughs> All right, that'll be the next panel. Thank you, everyone, and thank you to our esteemed panelists, Dimitri Demekis, uh, Fiona Frick, and of course, Michael Pouar, Paul Sheard, and John Williams. <laughs>